Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. In today's episode, I want to provide you with an update on the Chinese economy. If you've been following the channel, you'll know that over the course of the last few months, the Chinese economy has unexpectedly hit a slowdown. And the first batch of data for July 2023 revealed that exports were down 14.5%, imports were down 12.4% and that China has now officially moved into a state of deflation. So that means that prices year on year are falling in China. And that situation with regards to inflation is a complete contrast to what's been going on in the rest of the world. And more data has now been released for July, which shows that the situation is actually getting worse. Industrial production for the month has come in lower than expected. Retail sales are down against market expectations. The price of new homes in China, which is a really important metric, has fallen again. The country's largest property developer, Country Garden, which has around $194 billion worth of debt, is no longer able to service that debt and needs to enter a restructuring process. And one of China's largest investment trust businesses has missed the payments. And as a result of all of these economic woes, the value of the Chinese yuan continues to fall and Chinese state banks have been stepping in and trying to shore up the value. So in today's video, we'll go through the latest figures for industrial production, retail sales and the property market. We'll have a detailed look at what's going on with the Chinese yuan. We'll talk about the potential debt defaults amongst the property developers. We'll have a recap on what's happening with inflation and imports and exports. And then finally today, I'll wrap up with my summary. So what I think is likely to happen in the Chinese economy over the course of the next three to six months and what the impact of this will be on the global economy. This chart shows the movement in industrial production in China over the course of the last 12 months. And one of the reasons that this is a really important indicator is that China is a major manufacturer and therefore industrial production is at the heart of the Chinese economy. And if you look at the shape of this chart, you can see that we've got two undulations. This time last year, industrial output rose 4.2%. It then increased to 6.3% in September. However, in October, November, and December, there was a sharp reduction in industrial output. And in December, the growth actually fell to 1.3%. Now, that was at a time when China was still imposing lockdowns as a result of its zero-tolerance COVID policy. Now, at the end of December, the Chinese authorities took the decision to remove those restrictions. And that was the first time for almost three years that China was able to operate under a normal environment. And this change in policy was seen as being critical to boost the growth of the Chinese economy throughout the course of 2023. And initially, that strategy did have the desired effect. And we saw a return to growth in January, February, March and April when industrial production growth year on year increased to 5.6%. However, unfortunately, over the course of the last three months, we've seen a slowdown in the rate of industrial production growth. And the latest figures for July 23 show that year on year, industrial production increased by 3.7%, which is significantly below the expected level of growth of around 4.5%. Originally for 2023, the Chinese economy was looking at growth of around 6%, However, over the course of the last few months, expectations have started to come back down. And it was expected that in July, industrial production would grow by at least 4.5%. So an increase of 3.7% represents a significant shortfall against the expectations. And this is putting further pressure on the Chinese economy because as the monthly production starts to slow down, it's going to mean that the outlook for the rest of 2023 starts to get reduced further. This chart shows the movement in retail sales in China over the course of the last 12 months. And as you can see, the shape of this chart is similar to what we've just looked at for industrial production. China saw a slowdown towards the end of 2022 as the COVID-19 restrictions really started to cause havoc in the economy. However, in January, February, March and April, there was a bounce back as those restrictions were removed. But over the course of the last three months, we've seen a real slowdown in that recovery. And in July 2023, retail sales in China grew by 2.5% year on year, which is significantly below the expected growth level of 4.5% for the month. And the reason that this is important is that although China is a net exporter, it does sell a lot of its goods overseas. China is also a huge market for Chinese companies. China is the second largest country in the world in terms of population. 
currently has a population of over 1.4 billion. And domestic sales are very important for Chinese companies. But also why these retail sale figures are important is that it's an indicator of what's going on in the Chinese economy. If consumers are spending money on retail goods, then that means that there is growth in the economy. But when retail sales start to contract, that means that the economy is slowing down. And that's exactly what we're seeing in China right now. As we discussed at the start of the video, the inflation figures for July have actually moved into negative territory. Prices are down year on year. Now, you might have expected that to result in a retail boom that everybody would start buying more if things were cheaper. But what this is a reflection of is the fact that Chinese consumers are now becoming more conservative. They don't want to spend money. They're keeping their money in the bank rather than spending it at the tills. And that situation represents bad news for any economy. This chart shows the movement in newly built house prices in China over the course of the last 12 months. And the reason why this metric is so important is that the vast majority of house purchases in China are new build purchases. More than 90% of all deals are for new properties. And the scale on the right hand side of this chart marks the percentage movement in prices. At the top of the chart, we've got 0.5% growth. And at the bottom, we have 2% fall in prices. And as you can see, over the course of the last year, prices have fallen in China in 10 out of the last 12 months. Between August 2022 and February 2023, prices were falling year on year by more than 1%. However, in March and April, there was a slowdown in the fall in prices. And in May, prices officially rose by 0.1%. However, that recovery was very short-lived. And in June, prices were completely flat year on year. And in July, we've seen the market move back into negative territory. Prices on an annual basis have fallen 0.1%. However, what this chart doesn't reveal is the regional differences that are being seen in China right now. The property market in large cities such as Beijing and Shanghai is performing relatively well. However, the markets are performing significantly worse in some of the lesser cities. And the reason why this chart is so important is that the property sector is absolutely critical to the success of the Chinese economy. Over the course of the last 30 years, there has been huge growth in the property market fueled by the expansion of huge property development companies that were building apartments, towns and cities all over China. And consumers could not get enough of those new properties because the prices rose year on year. This was seen as being the best investment opportunity of all time. There was a feeding frenzy for a long period of time. Consumers were taking on large amounts of debt and buying property off plan before it was even built. But unfortunately, over the course of the last few years, the wheels have fallen off the market. The Chinese authorities introduced a new policy restricting the amount of debt that property developers could borrow. That meant that a lot of those developers were unable to build out all of the apartments that they'd pre-sold to consumers. And this left the market in a complete mess. And that mess, unfortunately, still hasn't been cleared up. And what we've got today is a situation where the huge property development companies are now all starting to either default on their debt or having to restructure all of their debt positions because they simply don't have enough money to be able to keep making their repayments. China's largest property developer, Country Garden, which has more than $194 billion worth of debt, recently missed $22 million worth of coupon payments on its debt. And it's been reported that the company does not have enough cash to meet its $1.25 billion repayment that's due in September. Country Garden has forecast a net loss of $7.6 billion for the first half of 2023, compared with a 1.9 billion yuan profit a year ago and has cited a drop in gross margin and an increase in inventory impairments. In a recent finding, the company apologized for its inability to properly forecast the depth and intensity of China's property downturn or to take earlier countermeasures, adding the understanding of potential risks such as excessive investment proportion in third and fourth tier and even lower tier cities were insufficient. The company recently posted a letter of apology on its social media account saying it felt guilty for not having done well enough it said it would put full effort into home completion, resolving liquidity pressure and ensuring operations continued. But unfortunately for China, Country Garden represents the tip of the iceberg. And other property companies that are currently in the process of restructuring include Evergrande, which is the company with the largest amount of debt in the world, more than $300 billion. 
and a raft of other developers who all took on huge amounts of debt during the boom period that they are now unable to service. And it now looks like the problems in the property sector are starting to spread to other parts of the Chinese economy. A major Chinese trust company that traditionally had sizable exposure to real estate, Zonggrong International Trust, has missed its repayment obligations on some of its investment products. Anxiety about contagion risks are now spreading through global markets, and analysts have warned that a rise in default by Chinese trust companies, also known as shadow banks, which have strong ties to the domestic property sector, will add further pressure to the economy. Trust firms or shadow banks operate outside many of the rules that govern banks, channeling the proceeds of wealth products sold by banks to developers and other sectors that are unable to tap bank funding directly. Concerns about the outsized exposure of China's shadow banks, a $3 trillion industry roughly the size of the UK economy, to property developers have grown over the past year as the sector has lurched from one crisis to another. JP Morgan, in a recent research note, stated that rising trust defaults would drag down China's economic growth by around 0.4 percentage points directly and that it expects a vicious circle of real estate financing challenges. In addition to the apparent financial risks in their transmissions, the latest wave of defaults from wealth management firms on trust-related products is likely to cause some substantial ripple effects for the broader economy through wealth effects, Nomura said in a separate note. This chart shows the movement in the value of the US dollar against the Chinese yuan over the course of the last six months. Six months ago, one US dollar was trading for around 6.8 Chinese yuan. Today, it's trading for more than 7.3, which represents a fall of more than 6% over this period, which may not sound like a groundbreaking move, but if we widen the chart out to show what's been happening over the course of the last five years, you can see that the current exchange rate is actually the worst position that the Chinese yuan has traded at at any point during that period. And this is at a time when the Chinese economy is meant to be in a growth phase. And given the data that's currently coming out of China and the reducing expectations for the economy for 2023, concerns are now rising that the Chinese yuan could start to crash. And it's recently been reported that China's major state-owned banks have been selling US dollars and buying yuan in the international markets to try to shore up the price. And this is always a warning sign for any currency because when central banks step in and try to start manipulating the price, that indicates that there are fundamental problems and that we're starting to see a run on the currency. And as we've discussed previously on the channel, the exchange rate for any currency is set by supply and demand. If there is rising demand for your currency, then generally speaking, that means that the price will go up and it will strengthen in value. However, if there is falling demand, then that means you'll usually see a fall in the value. And that's what we're seeing for China right now. Because the economy is slowing down, because industrial output is lower than expected, that means that the yuan is falling in the international markets. And China is trying to arrest that fall because it's trying to keep the value up. But that is a very expensive business to get into because you're basically using your reserves to try to keep the price up. This chart shows the movement in the official rate of inflation in China over the course of the last 12 months. And I think an interesting point to note before we start getting into the detail is that the target rate of inflation for China for 2023 has been set at 3% which is interesting because 3% is higher than the actual rate of inflation that China has achieved at any time in the last year. You can see that the highest level over the course of the last 12 months was achieved in September, where we had a rate of 2.8%. However, following that high, inflation actually fell to 2.1% in October and 1.6% in November. It did bounce back up in December and January to 1.8 and 2.1% following the removal of the COVID-19 restrictions, which were still causing major cities to go into lockdown. And at that time, it was expected that China would achieve strong growth throughout the whole of 2023. However, unfortunately for China, that didn't materialize and inflation fell to 1% in February, 0.7% in March, 0.1% in April, bounced back slightly to 0.2% in May, hit 0% in June, 
And in July 2023, the official rate of inflation for China was a fall of 0.3%. So what that means is that on average, prices today in China are 0.3% lower than they were this time last year. And as I mentioned at the start of the video, that is an absolute nightmare for all companies in China because the vast majority of companies have rising prices right now. So when your input prices are going up, but your sales price is going down, that's going to mean that you lose all of that from your profit margin. The reason that the Chinese authorities have set a target rate of inflation of 3% is that moderate growth in sales prices enable all of your companies to be able to pass on wage increases to their staff and also to absorb any increases in their costs. When you have a situation such as China is experiencing right now, where prices are falling, obviously it's very difficult for companies to be able to increase the wage of their staff because by doing so, they will be reducing their own profits. And if we expand the graph out to show the movements in the rate of inflation over the course of the last 10 years, you can see that there has only been one other period over the last 10 years that China has experienced deflation. And that was as a direct result of the COVID-19 pandemic, when a lot of the world shut down and demand fell for China's products, and therefore they had to reduce their prices. So the current situation is completely exceptional. And the fears at the moment are that China is following a similar path to Japan, which has struggled with deflation for the past 20 years or so, which has resulted in stagnation in the economy and a lack of wage increases. And if you put that into the context of your own life, basically that would mean that you would have to work for the next 20 years on exactly the same wages that you're on today. There would be no prospect of getting any pay increases. This chart shows the year-on-year -year movement in the value of China's exports over the last 12 months. And the scale on the right hand side of this chart goes from positive 15% at the top to negative 15% at the bottom. And if we start off by looking at the situation for July 2023, you can see that on a year on year basis, the value of China's exports fell by 14.5%, which is the fastest rate of decline that China has seen at any time in the last 12 months. And in fact, is the worst performance that China has experienced since the start of the COVID pandemic in 2020. And as I mentioned at the start of the video, the reason that this is such a major concern for China is that exports are the lifeblood of the Chinese economy. The strength of the Chinese economy is based on manufacturing goods, which it then exports to the rest of the world. And if we look at the trend as to what's been happening over the last 12 months, you can see that the fall in July is not a one-off event, as China has seen a fall in the value of its exports in eight out of the last 12 months. The decline in the value of exports started in October 2022, when China saw a minor fall of 0.3%. That fall accelerated in November to 9%, rose to just short of 10% in December, and increased further to 10.5% in January. Now, following the removal of the COVID-19 restrictions, under which China had been continually locking down major cities in December 2022, it was expected that in 2023, the Chinese economy would see significant growth. And in March and April, we did see a reversal in the fall in exports. However, unfortunately for China, that reversal was short-lived. And in May, we saw a fall in the value of exports of 7.1%. That increased to 12.4% in June, and we've now hit 14.5% in July. So you may be wondering what's causing this major fall in the value of Chinese exports. Well, the reason is a combination of a fall in demand in China, so home demand, combined with a fall in demand for Chinese goods from other countries. Exports to the United States, which is the largest market for all Chinese exports, fell 23.1% year-on-year in July, while shipments to the European Union fell 20.6% as diplomatic tensions mount over chip technology and de-risking from China. So the fall in the value of China's exports is a combination of a general weakening in global demand as we've seen economies starting to move towards recession and slowdown, and also a deliberate policy from some of the bigger economies to stop buying Chinese goods to reduce the exposure that they have to China. And once again, if we take a step back and look at the trend as to what's happening, 
there is a clear downward momentum here. If you were to draw a trend line across these bar charts, it indicates a strong downward momentum and tells us that things are going to be very challenging for the rest of 2023 for China. But as I mentioned at the start of the video, China is the second largest economy in the world. And it's not just exporting goods, it's also buying lots of goods from other countries. So if we're seeing a slowdown in the Chinese economy, it's likely to have a large knock-on impact to the global economy. So let's have a look at what's happening with Chinese imports. This chart shows the movement in the value of Chinese imports over the course of the last 12 months. And as you can see in July, the value fell by 12.4%. And the reason that this is concerning is that China is importing lots of commodities and raw materials, which it then uses in its manufacturing processes to produce goods to export. So the fact that the value of imports is falling gives us a strong indication that there is a slowdown in the Chinese economy. They're producing less goods and therefore the problems with exports and the overall economy are likely to persist. And if we take a step back and look at what's been happening to the value of imports over the course of the last 12 months, you can see that the problems with imports have been going on for a very long time and the value has fallen in 10 out of the last 12 months. As we discussed earlier, the COVID-19 restrictions were removed in December 2022, and the removal of these restrictions was expected to boost the Chinese economy. However, if you look at the value of imports, you can see that that boost was very short-lived, and it only resulted in a very short-term increase in February, and since that time, the value of imports has fallen in every single month. And once again, if you look at the trend here, you can see that there is clear downward momentum. And this tells us that the problems in China are likely to continue throughout the rest of 2023. And one very interesting point to note about China's imports in July is that the value of imports from Russia reduced by 8% to $9.2 billion, compared to an increase of 15.7% in June. And this fall is the first monthly decline in the value of imports from Russia since February 2021. And if you've been following the channel, you'll be fully aware that since Russia's invasion of Ukraine started in February 2022, Russia has made a concerted effort to increase the value of its exports of oil and natural gas to China as a direct result of the loss of trade from the West as a result of the sanctions that have been applied against Russia. So the fall in the value of Chinese imports from Russia represents a fall in demand for both oil and natural gas as a result of the slowdown in the Chinese economy. And what this demonstrates is that the slowdown of the Chinese economy will have a direct impact on a lot of other countries, including Russia, who are now more dependent on China than they ever have been. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video really to make sure that you had the latest data coming out of China. And what we've seen from the latest data is that unfortunately, things are continuing to get worse for China. The two biggest parts of the Chinese economy are manufacturing and property. And as we've seen from today's figures, unfortunately, China is underperforming in both of those sectors. Industrial output is down significantly against where China was expected to be at this point in the year. And that's having a knock-on impact to exports. And as we've seen from the import data, it's likely that this situation will continue because the amount of raw materials that China is buying in is falling. And that means that production is likely to continue slowing. And the extremely short-lived recovery that we saw in property prices, which managed to achieve 0.1% growth a couple of months ago, has now been completely wiped out and the property market is continuing to fall. Prices are coming down year on year. And what that means is that consumers are losing confidence. They don't want to buy property off plan anymore because it's no longer the free bet that it was 10 years ago. You won't automatically make a profit on those properties. So people are pulling back from that market and that is having a devastating impact on the property development companies. And this represents a major concern for China because over the course of the last 30 years, these companies have grown by taking on huge amounts of debt. But unfortunately, as with any debt, you have to repay it. You need to make interest payments and repayments. And because the brakes have been put so heavily onto the market, these property developers simply don't have the cash to be able to service their debt. 
So all of these companies are now facing potential default and they're having to restructure all of these facilities. And this is causing major problems for China because a lot of the debt has been provided by Chinese banks. So this is a very vicious circle. If those developers can't make those repayments, then the banks won't get their money. Therefore, the banks will have to report losses. They won't be able to pay dividends to their shareholders and so their share prices will fall and so this really could have a domino effect on the whole Chinese economy. And whilst we've been talking about the problems for the property developers over the course of the last couple of years, the reason that it's becoming more of an issue now is because the overall Chinese economy is slowing down and is having major problems. So China can't bail out the property sector from the success of its manufacturing industry because that's also suffering. So this really is a double whammy from China's point of view. Property is down and on its knees and unfortunately the rest of the economy is also coming down at the same time. And as a result of all of these problems, inflation has now gone into negative territory. We've got deflation in China, which is a very difficult problem to solve. The only other major country that's experienced significant deflation over the course of the last 20 years is Japan. And they have taken decades to try to shake that off. So if China does get into a genuine circle of deflation, it's going to cause major problems. And as a result of everything that's going on in China right now, the value of the yuan is falling in the international markets. Now, the Chinese banks are currently trying to keep the value up by buying yuan. But that situation can only continue for a short period of time because it's very expensive to uphold the value of your currency in the international markets for the long term. So the overall summary of today's video is that the recovery that we saw in China in the first part of 2023 has been short lived. The economy is starting to slow down rapidly and all of the indicators point to the rest of 2023 being a very tough period for China. It's likely that China is going to significantly under exceed its expectations for this year. And the problems that are building in both manufacturing and the property sector represent major challenges for China. So this is all really bad news for the Chinese economy. But as I've mentioned many times before, China is the second largest economy in the world. And so when China slows down, it will have a major impact onto the global economy. So unfortunately, as we see a contraction in China, it's going to drag down the global economy and further increases the chances of a global recession. We've just seen news in Europe that the Netherlands is now officially in recession. And this represents the second European economy after Germany, which is also in recession. And one of the reasons that the Netherlands is important is that despite the fact that it is a relatively small country in terms of population, it's a big player in the world of oil and gas. And as the global slowdown started to pull down the price of those products, that's had a devastating impact onto the economy for the Netherlands. So we're starting to see economies going into recession. And as China continues to slow down, there is a high possibility that we will see more economies hitting recession during the later part of 2023 and the early part of 2024. So hopefully you've enjoyed today's episode, you found it useful, informative and thought provoking. If you've liked what I've said, then please give me a thumbs up. Thank you for watching this video all the way through to the end. And here's something to put a smile on your face.